Hi, everybody, and welcome to Serverless Office Hours. Today, I've got two guests on the show. We've got uh, Denise Young, who's a product manager with Step Functions, and we've got Brian Zambano, Brian, Zambrano, excuse me, which I think we've seen before on the show, Brian, haven't we? Who is yeah, I've been here. Yeah, I've been, I've been here a few times. Yep. Uh, so I'm a special solutions architect, uh, focused on event driven architectures, Step Functions, and Event Bridge. Great. And Denise, what do you do when, you, when you're product managing at Step Functions? Yeah, so uh, hi everyone, I'm Denise here. Thanks for having us, James. Um, yeah, so I'm a product manager on the Step Functions team and pretty new to the team. I've been with AWS for five months and uh, one of the first thing I did was uh, support the launch of this new feature we're gonna talk about today, the distributed map for Step Functions. Great. Well, it's the same drill as always. So if you've seen the show before, just this is driven by your questions. So we've got everybody here who can answer questions about these new features launched at reInvent. So if you have anything you want to know and you're watching on LinkedIn or YouTube or on Twitch, just type in your questions, they pop up on our panel and then we'll ask them to our guests. But let's see what we're talking about today. So today we'll be going through the distributed map state that was launched with Step Functions. These are the three people in the show today. Now, if you missed last week's show, that was with Dave Boyne and my team and they were talking about Amazon EventBridge Pipes, that new feature again, which launched at, at uh, reInvent. So if you want to watch that, there's a QR code on the screen so you can catch up on last week. Also, even since reInvent, there's been a lot of new releases and things happening and a lot of new blog posts on the compute blog. So here are a number of topics that have come in the last week. You can catch all of these at s12d.com forward slash serverless dash blogs. One thing I'd like to call out is a really exciting thing that the DA team launched called Serverless Espresso Extensions. So if you want to build extensions to our serverless espresso demo, that post shows you all about how you can do that and contribute to the, go to the code base. Also, even though reInvent is over, the releases are not over, they're never over. So you can see a list of all the things that our services have been releasing since then too. We always maintain that at s12d.com forward slash what's dash new, but here's just a list of some of the things that various services have launched even since reInvent. Okay, so let's get to it. Today we'll be talking about large-scale parallel data processing with step functions. So, Denise, I will hand, hand it over to you. Yeah, so Brian has a demo um, set up to show us how to build workflows with distributed map. But before we go through that, I want to talk a bit about the journey that led us to this launch. So what we saw is uh, many customers have been using step functions for processing data sitting in Amazon S3. And a use case that we've seen quite often is customers setting rules in Amazon EventBridge so that when a user or an application or some entity drops an object into that S3 bucket, EventBridge is able to trigger um, a step function workflow execution. And within that step function workflow, you can see here, it could do a variety of things. So very commonly, it would run some Lambda functions to process the object. Or maybe um, sometimes we see uh, purpose-built AWS services as well in there, such as uh, Amazon recognition for image recognition. And this pattern was great for event-driven data processing. Uh, as you can see, that architecture is very decoupled and it scales very well. But customers wanted more and they had a different use case in mind as well. So they wanted to process data on demand for a collection of items that were already sitting in an S3 bucket. So items already there, run a step functions workflow on them. So in late 2019, we introduced what we are now calling the inline map state. It enables dynamic parallelism. So you can pass this map state an array of items as input and then step functions will execute the same steps um, for each item in the array. And then with very little effort here, you really do achieve parallel processing without having to think about multi-threading and you can really focus on the business logic, uh, business logic and how you want to process those objects. So we saw some great use cases um, with the maps that customers found it useful, but they also told us that they were running into some of the limitations. So for one, this inline map state, all the steps of those uh, workflows in that map state are run as uh, part of the same step function execution history, which is limited to 25,000 events. It also supports up to 40 concurrent iterations. So although you could process more items than that, uh, it could only run at a max of 40 iterations in parallel. And then from an input and output perspective to that map state, 
had to stay under that 256 kilobytes limit for the payload. Um, and this effectively limited the number of items that could be in the array. And customers wanted to process many more items than that limit would allow. So that leads us to um, the launch earlier this month. Uh, where we introduced a new distributed map to achieve uh, large-scale parallelism for uh, large data sets. So we support the fan and fan out processing with up to 10,000 concurrent executions. And we made it simple so you can reference and iterate over objects in S3 buckets or large files in S3. And we've provided a visual operator dashboard. And this is very core to our service and you can use it to track progress of each of those uh, parallel executions. And we've also made it easier to nest different workflow types, allowing you to process your data using either express or standard workflows. So in case you're not uh, familiar with the different workflow types, I'll just give a quick uh, high level summary here. So standard workflows are ideal for long running, durable and audible workflows, where you really want each step of your workflow to run exactly once, while express is ideal for high volume and uh, short duration workflows. So if we take a deeper dive into this uh, new distributed mode, uh, the distributed mode invokes iterations as individual child workflow executions. So these are independent of the parent state machine workflow. And this helps us to avoid that 25,000 event uh, history limit. We've also support multiple input, source, input sources <laughs> with distributed math. So you can iterate over an array of items just as you could with the inline math state. This could be passed on from the previous state of your workflow, uh, but we've added new functionality so you could uh, source from uh, S3 as well. So for example, if you provide an S3 bucket name and an optional prefix, or if you specify an S3 inventory file, that functions could iterate through the objects of those lists and pass the metadata for those objects uh, to your child workflows in that map state. We could also uh, iterate through items in a single large file. So if you have a large uh, CSV file with many rows sitting in S3 or in a large array of items in a JSON file in S3, we could iterate through those as well. And then uh, we made it so that you don't have to worry about the output uh, limit size exceeding that 256 kilobytes as well, because you have the option to write the execution output to back to Amazon S3. And like the inline map state, you have the ability to control the map concurrency. So you may not want to uh, run at 10,000 uh, concurrency. Uh, this is very useful for the state because your downstream services may have lower concurrency limits. So you can use this configuration to make sure you don't overwhelm those downstream services. Uh, we've also included the ability to batch items together uh, so you can process multiple items with one uh, child workflow execution. Now, this is uh, useful if your data processing stats really expects a collection of items or for cost optimization as well. And uh, the last thing I want to touch on here is around error handling with distributed map. So by default, uh, if any item or batch of item fails in a child workflow execution, this actually fails the entire workflow. And if you specified retries, then set functions can retry from the beginning of that map state. Uh, but beyond that, we've also included the ability to specify a tolerated failure threshold. So you're able to specify an absolute value or a percentage, and if failures um, are below that value, uh, the workflow will continue. Um, and because uh, the files can be outputted to S3, you can run uh, the workflow again on just the failures uh, later on. But this is helpful in case you have some unexpected issues uh, with a specific item in your data set or a specific object in that S3 bucket. Um, and just to summarize it all before I hand it over to Brian to walk through how to build this thing, uh, here's a quick picture summarizing how it all works. So step functions, you give it a S3 bucket, step functions will iterate over the data set um, and then start to invoke multiple child workflow executions to process those data sets using the workflow that you specified in your map state. Uh, it runs it with high concurrency and large scale parallelism. And once the processing is complete, the output can then be optionally written back to S3. 
This is great. So I've got a couple of questions for you. So what sort of developers in what sort of industries are using this most commonly? What are their use cases? Yeah, so one of the uh, key people that we see using this would be developers. So a lot of developers already have code that's used to process a single object. So what we've done is now made it easier. So if you already have this code, you can simply use the state and now it can um, run that code on multiple objects at once and with uh, high velocity. So Brian, you might know this. So what people, before this, before this came along, what were customers doing instead? Were they rolling their own in their own code? What was the approach taken to solve this problem before? Yeah, I think in general, a lot of folks, you know, with step functions, you know, were doing this on their own. So that, you know, with step functions is, is so flexible. Um, I mean, you have the ability to do, you know, pretty much arbitrarily complex uh, workflows. And so, you, you know, you could work around this on your own. But again, like what we heard was that, you know, people want to do this natively without having to, to, to come up with these solutions on their own. So I don't want to have to paginate around a list of, uh, you know, like I don't want to use an, uh, an AWS SDK and deal with the pagination myself. Like why can't AWS just do it for us? So yeah, people were working around this, but this just makes it that much easier. Very exciting. So, well, are we ready for a demo? Do you want to see how this works? Yeah, let's go for it. Yeah, great intro, Denise. Um, I will share my screen, and while oops, and while I am doing that, um, so this is a demo that I did. We have a reinvent session um, where I did the same thing. So it's the same demo. The nice thing here is that we have more time, so we can get into it a little bit more. Um, so I am hopefully that sharing is coming through. Is it, James? I don't see it yet. There you go. I see. You. Yep. There we go. Okay, great. Thank you. So what this is, is this is going to, uh, we're going to do a little bit of, of analysis on what's called the NOAA global surface uh, data set. And what it is, it's the NOAA, which if you don't know, it's the national in the US, it's the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association. And so what they've been collecting is uh, surface weather data on the surface of the earth. Um, for a long time. It goes back, I think, 1929. And what it does is it summarizes each station around the world um, by day. And so in there, it gives you, you can see here, it's like the, the, the mean or the average dew points, um, wind speed. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through and figure out, um, we're going to look at the temperature by station, and we're going to figure out where, for a given month, what station has the highest temperature for the given month. So we're not going to, we don't really care about the day in particular, but we just care about in a given month, where is the highest temperature? So the reason why I like this is one, there's a lot of data. Two, it's relatively simple. So there, these are just CSV files and this is what it looks like. Hopefully you can see that. All right. Um, but this is a sample of what the data looks like as CSV. So it's just rows and columns, right? Typical, just regular CSV. The thing that we're going to care, we care about a three different columns. So one is the station, that's the station ID. That's that first one over here. And this is just, it's a unique identifier for a given station. Uh, the other one of course is gonna be the date. So you can see here it's year, month, day. So this is uh, January 1st, 2018, then January 2nd. And so what we need to do is we need to, to look get parse this date, but then just extract, we need to look at you know look at the actual month. So we need to do a little bit of logic here, but it's nothing very very complicated. And then the final one is this temperature. And so this temperature, what we will do is um, take this value and then find out again, do some little bit, little bit of uh, conditional logic, very simple. Who has the highest temperature, average temperature by day in a given month? So now if I go over and look at the data set, so I have this data now over in my, my own S3 bucket. I've copied it over from the, uh, from the NOA uh, uh, bucket. And you can see how, here how it's organized. So these are the different years. And if I click into any one of these randomly, um, you'll see there's a bunch of CSV files. Um, they're relatively small. So I think the average here is about 60 to 70 uh, K kilobytes. Um, so in total, this data set has about 560,000 files and the total size of this is roughly 37 gigabytes. So it's a pretty good size. It's not too enormous. We're not into the petabytes, but we're in the you know, gigabytes. So it's, it's, it's substantial. The other interesting thing here is that there's just a lot of them. So again, 560,000 of them. 
So James, you know, going back to your question, like how do people deal with this originally or before distributed map came out? Well, you know, there's a an SDK called uh, SDK uh, API call called list buckets, uh, list buckets v2. And what you do is that you know you pass in this this API call a bucket name, um, and it will literally you know give you a, an output of the contents of that. The issue there though is that you it will only return a thousand objects. So if you want to process before, you could process that in batches of a thousand. But what you would have to do is create a recursive uh, workflow. So grab a thousand records, do some processing, and then go on to the next, you know, pass the, the, the pagination token back in and keep doing that until, you, you know, until you're, you're all done. Um, and so that would work. The issue though, is that it's going to be, it's in batches. So it's not parallel. So you could, you know, again, you could, you know, at most you could process a thousand records in parallel at any given time. So we'll, you'll see here uh, in a moment how distributed map changes that and it gives us, it allows us to process all of this uh, in parallel or, or most of it in parallel. So let's go in to uh, set functions. So this is the set functions uh, console. So I'm gonna build this from scratch. Um, and again, I will, you know, uh, the, you know, admit that some of this has been created behind the scenes a little bit. So I have some, my, my Lambda functions have already been created. I have an IAM role, but, um, this is all in you know, the, the, the GitHub repo that, um, that shows, you know, how to build this on your own. But this, this, what I'm about to do building it visually, I think is really going to drive home kind of how easy it is to get started. So, uh, I'm going to build this visually. So I'm just going to click on next. So. The first thing that I need to do is uh, is create a, a this distributed map state. So um, this is this is what it is. You'll see here over on the left under flow, there's this there's this you know uh, state called map um, has a little updated icon, and when I drag that in, you'll see that now in this processing mode section, there's there's a choice. So you can either have a, what's called an inline map, and that is what Denise mentioned earlier, this is what we had originally before reInvent. So the new version, which is what I'm going to select, is called distributed map. So I'm going to select that, and then I'm going to name this state, uh, I'll call it dmap for distributed map. Okay, so now this is the shell that is actually is, is going to control our parallelism, that's going to execute the same workflow in parallel, um, and it, it could be arbitrarily complex within here. So um, to start off, what I need to do is tell it where to get the data. Uh, again, here you have a choice. There's either the, the state input, which is literally what we pass in to the distributed map run uh, when we uh, start the execution, or S3. Typically, with distributed map, because you know the idea is you're going to be working on bigger sets of data, it's going to come from S3. And so here, uh, I'm going to say object list. So what this does is it tells distributed map, go out and, and, and list all those objects for my S3 bucket for me. So again, this is what you could have done on your own before this, but this makes it really easy because distributed map is gonna do all that work for you. So I'm gonna tell it what buckets to, uh, to process. So I'm gonna enter my own bucket name. Uh, this guy, whoop, wrong one. What's our URL? So I'm going to enter my bucket name. So this is the bucket name that we were looking at in the, in the other tab. Uh, there's no prefix for this. And now if I expand the this additional configuration, there's a couple other things that you could do here to get a little bit more sophisticated. One of them that I recommend during testing is this limit number of items. So if you're testing this, you know, I you know, when I was building this originally, I was doing, you know, limiting to like the, you know, the first thousand records. Uh, but here we're going to process all 560,000 of them, so I don't need that. Um, so item batching is another really key uh, 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 control to actually use. Now, what this does is, uh, if you're for, if, for those of you familiar with using Lambda with SQS, uh, you know with SQS there is an ability to take a batch of records and pass those all to a Lambda function. So you don't have to do that. Um, it could be you know, a one-to-one -one mapping where you know, one record, uh, one object that goes onto an SQS queue gets delivered to one Lambda function. But this is an optimization technique where you, know, you can have one Lambda function process, get, process many 
records from SQS. The nice thing there is that it limits the number of, uh, of Lambda invocations you have. Um, and so, you know, the price of your, your Lambda uh, costs can go down because you're just using Lambda less. It's the same idea here. So out of all these 560,000 objects or, C, or S3 records, um, if I passed each one of those to one Lambda function, that'd be 560,000 Lambda invocations. Instead, because of these functions are fairly small, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass 500 records to my Lambda function at, in, in one go. So 560,000 divided by 500 is about 1,100 Lambda invocations. So we're really going to drop the number of Lambda invocations. And because these files are pretty small, my Lambda function can still easily process that in a reasonable amount of time. So here, I'm going to set this to 500. Um, and then you also have the ability to set this, um, rather than, than max items per batch, is to set the maximum size of, uh, of data. And that is the input, which in our case is going to be uh, the S3 records and just pointers to those S3 objects. So for our purposes, the max items per batch is what we need. Another nice thing here is this concurrency limit. So, you know, by default, when you're using the uh, the Visual Builder like this work uh, workflow studio, the default is a thousand. And so, what this is is the the maximum concurrency that distributed map is going to uh, scale out to. So, by default here, it, it filled in a thousand for us. I'm going to scale this up. Uh, I'm going to scale this up to three thousand. So in this account and, and region that I'm running, my account limits have been um, have been raised uh, slightly. So one thing also to keep in mind is what you are actually uh, using to process all of this. So if you're using Lambda, um, you know you could you could scale this out to ten thousand, but make sure that 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 your account in your, the region that you're running can actually support that level of concurrency. And it's the same thing whether you're making API A calls or, or whatever. Distributed map is, is very powerful in terms of the concurrency. So you definitely want to make sure and keep, you know, keep track of what you're actually connecting to and can it handle the concurrency that you ha now have the power to use. All right. So the next thing is what type of child execution workflow are we going to run? So in my case, uh, the Lambda, we're going to use a Lambda function within here. And these are going to run relatively quickly. Um, I know that because, again, I've tested this before. Um, but here, I can actually use an express workflow. So our express workflows are great for something that is, is, is uh, sensitive to time. So we want this to go really quickly. They have a five-minute execution limits upper limits and so my lambda function is going to uh going to go much quicker than that so here i can exp uh, use the express workflow now finally the output from all this from my from my processing needs to go somewhere so again like what denise said earlier was that the output limits that we had um for a state is limited it's 256k so the output from my lambda processing is going to be bigger than that, which means that I need to put all this data somewhere. And here, now you can actually output this to an S3 bucket. So again, I'm going to select the bucket that I've already created. Uh, results. I'm going to put that, uh, the output into this bucket. And again, we'll, we'll, we'll take the, a look at this later and see what that looks like. Um, and then I'm going to set the prefix to demo results. And then with that, we're done. So now you'll see here, like we've created this shell, this distributed map shell, but there's no processing going on. So there's no Lambda functions. So I'm gonna go and fix that. Well, uh, Brian's looking for that Lambda function. One thing I did <clears throat> wanna note is for both the result writer and the um, input source, we allow dynamic variables as well. So you don't have to hard code the bucket names and a prefix. They can be defined at one time. Yep. Thank you, Denise. That, that's a great call out. So the first bit of uh, work that we need to do is actually do that processing, which you know this is this this demo simulates a typical map reduce workflow where you're doing this map phase is doing some bit of logic, writes the result somewhere, and then the reducer compresses that into a final output. So the first bit of logic here um, is going to I'm going to call it mapper, and uh, I'm going to select the function that I've already created. And so here, this is called the temperatures function. 
Um, and we can go and look at the, the actual logic for this. It's, it's not very complicated, um, but we can look at this in a, in a little bit. So that's really all I need. So now this is the state, the inner state of my child workflows that is gonna scale out. So again, ma distributed map is gonna collect all these records, these 560,000, um, package them in batches of 500 and deliver a list of 500 records to each one of these Lambda functions in parallel. So once I have that, that's that's gonna go right output into that, uh, that bucket that I configured. And once that's all done, now what I need to do is do a final pass through and, and actually reduce the output from the mappers and do a final aggregation. Uh, I'll call this reducer. And again, it's the magic of TV. So I have that function standing by. So this is my reducer and that one's all done also. Okay. So now let me uh, go to the next state. So here's the, a, a summary of what it's what it actually generated, uh, what the workflow studio generated for me. So I'm gonna click on next and I'll call this the map demo on office hours. Now I need to give the, the, the workflow some permissions too. So I have a role that's existing. Uh, again, you know, best practice is you're, is you're probably doing this with some sort of infrastructure as code. So I'm gonna select my existing role and say, create state machine. All right, so now that's ready to go. So let's start an execution and we'll see what that looks like. Um, starting with the execution, it really doesn't matter what I give this because again, this is, you know, like if you were taking some dynamic values, you could pass in some configuration here. Like Denise said, you could pass in output buckets or input buckets, things like that. We have that all hard coded. Um, and so here, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to say start execution and, and we can ignore the input. All right. So now this is running. So if I click on the distributed map state, it looks a little bit different than may, what you may be used to. Um, so the first thing is uh, you'll see there's a, a link to this map run. Um, I'm going to click on that. It's not going to be populated yet because distributed map is still doing some work. Um, but you can see that it is it at, or actually already has already collecting some of the input. So the thing here, which I'll, where I'll draw your attention, is this pending area over here. So behind the scenes, what's happening is that distributed map, the distributed map state, is going out to our S3 bucket or my S3 bucket, and it's collecting all of the different keys or all of the different records in that bucket. So it's doing that list objects for us, getting all the input and preparing them to actually run. So you can see here, um, it moved pretty quickly. So not, they've moved now from pending over to running. So when I uh, refresh this, I should start seeing a few or many uh, running child workflows. So each one of these rows in this table is a child workflow. It's an independent workflow execution. And you can see also in this column, it says number of items. So again, each one is receiving a list of 500 S3 objects or S3 keys. So I'll click into one of those and we can look at some of the detail. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but I clicked into that one. That one has already completed. So this is a part which might kind of drive home if you're a little bit confused about what the details about what's going on, what it's getting and what it's doing. This makes it very clear. So here in the execution input and output tab, uh, what I see is I can actually see the execution input. This right here, um, you can see it's an array. Uh, if I collapse that, there's nothing else. So it's an array of items. This happens to be 500 items long. And what it is, is a list. Uh, this is the output from uh, from the list objects. But the, the, the important bit here is this key record, this key, uh, which it points to a single S3 object. So my Lambda function receives this list. The Lambda function will iterate through all of these. It reads these S3 records or the CSV files in S3. And then just, again, it does a little bit of math to figure out who has the highest temperature for a given month. So the output over here on the right is what my Lambda function is producing. So it's a mapping or a dictionary in Python lingo. Uh, where the key is year and month, and then the, 
the the value of that happens to be the the record of that particular station that represents the highest temperature for a given month. And so you can see here the highest temperature happened to be uh, on January seventeenth. Uh, this is the highest temperature for January of this year, twenty twenty two, and the temperature, if I can find it over here. Uh, was 100.2, and this happens to be in Fahrenheit. So if those of you, you uh, who are used to thinking in Celsius, don't worry. Um, and it looks like, uh, I don't know where this was, but um, I, don't, maybe, I don't know if that's Argentina, AR. I'm guessing it's the Southern Hemisphere since it's January. So that's what the, the Lambda function does. So it, out, it, it spits these out uh, for every iteration. So if I go back here, it's already completed. Um, and what I'd like to do is step over uh, back to the, um, the the overall summary, the map run. So I'll go back to there. So you can see here, here's the summary. So 100% of these have been processed. Um, again, you know, almost 560,000 S3 objects were processed uh, because, as a reminder, we were processing 500 records per uh, per child workflow, this is going to be about uh, about a thousand um, a thousand child workflows. So you can see all those in here. Um, James or Denise, like anything that I miss or you know, any clarifying points that you'd, you'd like to make? Uh, I was next. I was going to dive into like where the output is written and then how the final reducer step works. We have a lot of questions, but I'll save them to the end. But I had a quick one, actually. So you had that question sure. about Fahrenheit versus Celsius. Is this something you could do in the workflow easily to convert that to Celsius if you wanted to? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I hadn't thought about that. I would say, you know, if, in this case, I mean, I'd say, you know, the, one of the things I love about step functions, it's so flexible. You can do so many different things. And so, you know, I'd imagine this is something that you could do here. Um, because I'm using a Lambda function already to perform a little bit of logic. And why don't I go, go over there and you can see what it's doing. Uh, because you're, I already have this ability to perform a little bit of logic, I think in this case, it would make sense just to add that logic within the, the Lambda function itself. Again, because I'm already processing it and doing, I have the full power of a programming language, Python mm -hmm. in this case. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think if you were doing maybe for a different type of analysis and you do need to do some jit some light transformation or, or some uh, some light, uh, some changes like that that's something you, you you might you might be able to do I frankly I don't know if we have the ability to do to do that kind of math within set functions natively hmm. all right well here is and I'll make this a little bit bigger but here's the actual uh, Python code that's doing this work. So this handler right here, this is the, the the mapper. So again, this is the part that's receiving a a record uh, at list of items with pointers to the S3 objects. And so you can see in here, you know, all it's doing is it's, it's iterating it around that list of items. So this is written generically. It's just it's just a loop. In our case, this is going to be. Uh, it's going to process this loop is going to go around 500 times because it's receiving 500 items and so there's a couple little helpers in here so it gets the the, the csv data with this little helper function uh, it changes it from csv into a python dictionary and then you know lines 30 through uh, really through 46 this is the logic that it's using so it grabs out the temperature casts it to a floating point does a little bit of date math to figure out to get the, the year, month, day into just month. And then again, is using another dictionary, Python dictionary to figure out, is this temperature that I'm seeing in this iteration higher than what I've seen previously? And if it is, it just puts it into the dictionary. Um, and then finally, it just returns that, that final result. And that was that output tab that we saw. If I go to any one of these, that was this output over here on the right. So that's what that final return value is doing. So remember, we have you know about a thousand of these working in parallel at any given time, and they're they're writing their output somewhere. So the Python function returns that um, to the workflow. We instructed distributed map to actually go and write those results somewhere. And so let's go take a look about and see where those go and, and kind of what it looks like. So let me look at here, results. 
So here are here's these this results bucket. So if you think back to when I was creating the the workflow, I instructed distributed map to write the results here, and I put in a prefix of demo results. And so here, if I click into this demo results uh, path, I have one uh, you know key in here uh, or, or folder, if you will. And um, it has two files. One is a manifest file, which describes what is, is actually in here. And the second one is the succeeded JSON record or JSON object. Now you'll notice that it's about a hundred megabytes. So remember the, 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 the constraints that we have for step functions is that the, an output from any state can only be 256 K. And so now we're writing all the results into our S3 bucket, which gets us away or you know, allows us to output from our distributed map run, allows us to output more than that 256K. So again, all of the mappers are writing their results to this one succeeded.json file or this bucket, and then step functions will, will output the succeeded ones to the succeeded.json file. And so that's where all of the results go. If anything failed, you would see a failed.json file in here with some details about, about what happened. Um, and so, yeah, so the, you know, the, the, the final output goes here. Now, my reducer, my reducer's job is to take those, that, that's those outputs from all the distributed map runs and do a final aggregation or a final reducing step on it. The reason why we have to do this is because in this analysis, we have no guarantee that a, 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 the highest monthly temperature uh, in one run is actually going to be the the valid the valid high temperature for a given month. So if you think about it, different bits of you know different parallel runs could be working on data that produce the same output or the same highest temperature for a given month. So in my example, um, you know here there might be multiple records that are processing and have found a high temperature for December of 2022, and so the final reducer reducer step basically performs the exact same calculation. So um, if you go and, and, and look through some of this, this is just housekeeping. So this is reading that succeeded file, parsing out the actual data, um, and then the, the actual application logic, it's exactly the same. So it's going through the, the, the output from all the mappers and doing one last path to figure out who really does have the highest temperature for a given month. So that's all that the um, the that's all the reducer is, is is doing. You'll notice here that the final step in the reducer is actually, is writing the results to DynamoDB. And so if I go over to DynamoDB, and I'll go, I'll open up the tables, and I'll look at this one, and we can explore these table items. So now the results here are. The final results, which you know, these represent again the highest temperature in a given month um, for a particular day, um, and so that's what the reducer is doing again: the final aggregation and then writing this, these results to S three or sorry to, to DynamoDB. All right, well, I'll pause there, and happy to take questions or drill into any more uh, any more details. Yes, yeah, so I'll go from the top from the very first question that came in. There's quite a few, so. Let's start with this one from Sahil. Is there any limitation on the file size that can be processed? Yeah, I can take that one. Uh, for those uh, SPSV and JSON files, we're limited at 10 gigabytes right now. And from Wasim, how does this compare to EMR? Brian, do you want I to would take that? Yeah, I would love to take that one. So, yeah. you know, Early on, I mean, we're still getting feedback from 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 our customers around you know how this works, when to use it. One of the you know Denise and her team, I mean, one of the, the premises here was there are a lot of people out there um, who are very good at step functions, who are developers, and who are very comfortable in this ecosystem. I definitely identify as you know a, a, in that group. So I'm a developer. Um, I wrote code for 20 years, and so I've you know if if I have a need to do some data processing. This is a great tool for me. Uh, the reason is that I am not a great uh, EMR developer. So I've done, I've done a little bit of Hadoop in my day, hmm. but I am by no means an expert. I mean, if I was going to do some, some, some data processing with, uh, with EMR, I'd have to go and do quite a bit of work to figure out how it works, 
uh, set it up. Um, it, it would take me a while to get started. This is a great tool again for developers. So I would say that, you know, if you are a, you know, an EMR customer um, and if that's working out well for you, and if you are uh, fluent in that ecosystem, by all means, I think, you know, keep, keep using it. But, you know, if you're a developer, who needs to do some data processing and doesn't want to go and, and invest time and energy in, in, in coming up to speed with those technologies, I think this is a great option. Are there any order guarantees when using max concurrency equals one? Yeah, so we do process uh, that array of items in the order it comes in. So in the list objects API, the thing S3 list system, I think in alpha numeric order, we'll just process it one by one in that order. Okay. Also from Nathaniel, question number two, it's a two-parter. So mm -hmm. are there plans to increase the max file size limit of 10 gigabytes? I'm curious to hear about this use case, something I can definitely bring back to the team, but Nathaniel is uh, very curious to hear about your use case here, what you're looking at. Yeah, I'd be curious to hear that too. And, and I would say there, you know, there, I think there's, there's probably a sweet spot with distributed map. And that is, um, you know, a lot of small files. Um, and I think there's an upper limit too. I mean, I think at a certain point, like if you were trying to process one file that was, um, I don't know, a petabyte, it wouldn't be a great use case. Um, I mean, I think you could still use this, but they would, it would mean breaking that file up into smaller pieces to get that that parallelism, so you know, in this in this case, um, you know, if these files, let's say instead of you know sixty k, they were six hundred k, it would still completely work. If it was they were six megabytes, it would still totally work. the The trade off here that what you have to consider is, um, you know, you want to take advantage of that parallelism. So more files is going to allow you to take advantage of the parallel mm -hmm. parallelism. Mm -hmm. Smaller or bigger files, uh, if you have fewer bigger files. You just don't get the parallelism that this provides. Yeah. So to Brian, why if you simply requested all the objects initially with list bucket version two using multiple calls and then start parallel processing, does that remove the 1000 limit that you described? Let's see. So um, if we requested all the objects initially using multiple calls and then start parallel processing, so I think the question uh, was seen was if you were if you were doing this yourself manually, like is the question like could you work around this limitation yourself? Is that right? That's how I understand it. Yes, how I how I read it too. Same. Yeah, yeah I mean, if you were doing this yourself um, before distributed map, yes and no. I mean, you could yourself, you know, you you could do multiple calls and build up an array of all the items. But we still didn't give you a way to process those all in parallel easily. Um, you could have done it. I mean, you could have built up the list of objects and then somehow kicked off something uh, where Lambda was all processing these in parallel. So it, you know, technically, I could probably think of you know this, this would be possible. There's a lot of housekeeping. I mean, it's a lot of things yeah. that you would have to have had to do yourself. And so now you can see here, it was really easy for us to create mm -hmm. this interactively uh, and it just not have to worry about it. Yeah, we did see customers nesting multiple inline maps to try yeah. and do something similar um, as well to get that higher concurrency and I guess address this. But as Brian mentioned, what we've done is made all that housekeeping go away with distributed map. Yeah. So are distributed maps the equivalent of the map reduce pattern in other large systems? Do distributed maps have to reduce step to summarize the data? I suppose the broader question here is really, how does this compare to map reduce in other systems? I think um, the Brian had a sh showed an example of using the result writer file, so taking either the succeeded files or the failed files to do that reduction step. Um, so you can certainly uh, work that pattern using the uh, distributed map. Yeah, and I think, you know, this one is, you know, this is, this is a fun example, I think, because it's the, the, da the data size is big enough to be significant, but not overwhelming. Mm. It's also very easy to understand. It's like easy to understand how to do just basic, you know, logic to figure, find a high temperature. Um, there are, you know, there are certainly other 
it, so, so I would say like, you know, you could, you can use a distributed map for a map reduce operation like this. Um, one thing I think is worth calling out too, is that, you know, with, with real, you know, like call Hadoop or uh, a real, you know, map reduce, one of the key things there was data locality mm. um, and not having to move data around. Right. And so a reducer was more, you know, I'm going to go and reduce the final, the, you know, the output after I've mapped it on this one node and only ship the final output over to you know somewhere else when when you know and not having to move all that data back and forth you know we're in a distributed system here i mean everything behind the scenes here is of course like aws services and so that that data locality doesn't really matter as much i would say um because everything's you know data's moving all over the place um and there's really you know i, I can't think of a way to take advantage of data locality in this in this regard um so i say like, you know that is to say MapReduce is one way to, to use this, but I mean, I'm already seeing people use this for data transfer. So uh, a, a fellow solutions architect just the other day was asking how to use this to move uh, data from a relational database that had been dumped out as JSON files into Dynamo. Mm. And so he took a crack at this and was able to do that really fast, again, taking advantage of the parallelism. So, mm. you know, data transfer, data processing, I mean, anything where you need scale, uh, parallel scale, I think this is a great tool. MapReduce is just one of them. Yeah. Uh, when we don't know in advance how long our distributed map is going to take, do we need to keep increasing the concurrency until we get it to under five minutes before selecting Express? Uh, so the step where Brian uh, chose Express, that was only specific to the child workflow execution. So each of those child workflow executions has to be under five minutes. Your million item run can be much higher than that because that distributed map state is actually in a parent standard workflow. So that could run up to one year potentially. It could. Yeah. Great. Yep. I see you're writing the results to S3 and you're putting them in a prefix. Does the prefix or the workflow add any hexing to the prefix for those cases where you may start to run into S3 out limits? Let's see. So if we go and look here, um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I give it a, a prefix and then within the, within the output prefix I think is the actual, limits, by the way. Sorry, say that again, James. I think, I think this means put limits. I think it's a typo. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh I, I understand. So yeah. talking about like, can you actually overwhelm the the S three API with and, right. and hit limits there? Yeah. So um, we cap the files that we write. So you could have multiple uh, succeeded and multiple failed files. We're writing um, five gigs, I believe, and and then we split the files off. Hey, look, we've got Jeff Barr. Jeff Barr's watching. So uh, hi, Jeff. How are you doing? Hi. Glad you're enjoying this feature. Uh, let's see what else is there. There is also from Wasim, is there any risk of overriding the mapper output since all mappers may collide when updating that JSON file? Uh, the result writer, that's what we call the, uh, part, the part of ASL that writes the results to S3. Um, that happens at the end of the workflow. So after all the child executions complete, we then do the writing and it's written in the same order as your original um, input. Okay, and that leads very nicely to Nathaniel's next question. Will the output file ever be split yeah. if it grows too large? Yep, so that's a five gig, gigabyte okay. file sizes. So the manifest will let you know how many succeeded files were written out and how many failed files and how many pending files there have been written out, but it is split. Do you have any guidelines on breaking long processes to take advantage of distributed map besides breaking into smaller independent units? So I think that question would probably be around the the, the inner child workflow ex executions. Mm -hmm. So you know, if those are taken, I mean, you know, one thing in, in here, like, you know, the data that I'm processing is fairly small, but I'm processing 500 of those. Um, yeah, I think I, I can show it. If I go over to CloudWatch, uh, I think I have to open this up. But what I was doing is, you know, I'm looking at, you can see over here, the average duration for my, my Lambda functions is about 30 seconds, mm. which is which is pretty good, right? But imagine that there was an order of magnitude difference. So imagine, you know, this was taking 300 seconds 
um, or you're approaching some other you know, upper limits. So I think the thing there would be, you know, one, just process less data in every step. I mean, that would be really the big, uh, the big one to, to, to watch out for. The big lever to pull is do less. Um, you can still, again, take advantage of that parallelization, but just do less in, in each step. So that could involve, you know, yeah, many things, optimizing whatever you're, you know, you're doing within the child workflow, um, working on less data, things like that. Actually, I did have a couple of questions around that from what you were saying earlier. So with batching in the Lambda function, where you take in more records to process over a longer duration, do you have any tips on how to optimize that for your costs so you make sure the duration doesn't exceed the total number of invocation costs? What's a good way to find the sweet spot when you're batching? Yeah, Denise, do you, I mean, do you want to speak to that a little bit, just in, around, in, around the pricing, or if you have tips? I mean, I can certainly chime in. Yeah, so from um, from a set functions perspective, distributed map uh, try just one state transition for each iteration that started. So when you batch items, fewer iterations definitely the best approach for cost optimization. Um, and Brian, I'll let you tackle the uh, the piece on lambda requests. Yeah. So, um, you know, again, here it's, I think it's going to be, it's, you know, the, the, I think the key is understanding like how much data you have, how fast you need to go. Um, and then balancing that, balancing that with your cost. So, you know, mm -hmm. here, I mean, we could even try this if I, we wanted to here. Um, but if I was going to not batch and just have one file get processed by one Lambda function, that's 560,000 Lambda invocations. Number one, mm -hmm. two is that each one of those, parallel runs uh, counts as one state transition. So the Lambda function, you know, you, you will get built for that. A little bit more importantly here is that the state transitions explode, right? Mm. So here you would, you, would, you would change that by two orders of magnitude because you'd be going from roughly a thousand to about 500,000. Mm. And so your distributed map run becomes more expensive. And so what you, you really need to do is just, I think you need to know your data and know how fast you, you want to go and then think how much you're willing to pay for that. Um, again, you can control all of these by, you know, by controlling, I think the batching is really the key, yeah. uh, the key lever here to, to keep track of. Um, and just, you know, again, working within your constraints too. Like if, you know, if, if one run takes 10 minutes, well, you can't really batch that. But if one run takes, you know, a hundred milliseconds, you can really use batching and again, drive those costs down and mm. keep this, uh, keep this less expensive. Also, what happens in the event that new objects appear in the bucket in the middle of a run? Are those objects included or are they excluded from that workflow? They're, they're excluded if they're added after. Um, and you also mentioned, Brian, the IAM role that you were using here. Is there anything special about that role that you're using for the workflow to access the bucket? No, there's really nothing special. I mean, the one that I use was just, um, you know, it was just an easy one that I had created. So it has a lot of privileges. It's a little bit, a little bit too open. Mm -hmm. um, I do set this up with uh, AWS SAM. And so the one, the, the SAM uh, application that I have in our AWS samples, GitHub repo does follow best practices. So it's very limited in what it can do. It has least privileges, but there's nothing special to it. It's, it's typical IAM. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our console experience also has an easy role creation. So if you're trying this mm -hmm. for the first time, you can use that feature and it will automatically uh, create the role for you as well. Yeah. I mean, I really think this is one of the most exciting features we've seen for a very long time. And, you know, Step Functions has been creating a lot of exciting features recently. So uh, it's really amazing to see this progress. One thing I'd say to everybody watching is that, especially since we have Denise, who's a PM on the call, is that this is still an active development. We'll be adding more mm -hmm. and more features as it goes. So as you use and play with this, and we've got some examples in serverless land patterns you can play with if you want to try that, and you see something you want to see, let the DA team know or anybody on this call. And we, can, we can make sure that that gets added to the roadmap. We're really interested in hearing what you think about it. That's basically how we build things at AWS. Uh, when, when customers want things, we go build them. So that's the easiest way to get what you want in these services. Yep. I'll, I'll throw out too, there was a really neat use case that uh, Justin Callison, he's one of our leaders on the set functions team. Um, he created this, I think it was literally just two days ago and put it up again yeah. in our GitHub repo. Yeah. But it's a really neat use case where it's using distributed map only with our SDK integration. So there are no Lambda functions anywhere. And what it does is it deletes records or objects from an S3 bucket. 
And so here again, it's another case where we're taking advantage of listing a bucket and then doing something in parallel. And so I forget what he got, what what uh, what, what data rate he got to, or the number of records per per second or per minute. But he was able to again using just SDK states uh, with no lambda functions, delete a ton of data from an S3 bucket mm. very very quickly. So that was a really really neat one. Let's just back up there a second because we talk about SDK integrations a lot, but a lot of people watching may not know what you mean. So what do you mean by that exactly? Yeah, well, why don't I switch over um, and I'll actually show you kind of what that looks like. So um, I have a, a couple other uh, interesting um, state machines in here. So this is my first version of what I created for um, deleting data from a, a bucket. This is before Justin's uh, came along, but this shows... Um, how you can run a, a workflow without Lambda functions. So the first thing that this does is it is using this, this state. And if you go over to the left, um, we have actions. And what actions are is it has integration with practically all of our AWS SDKs. Hmm. And so if you're doing anything, um, you know, you can search here and to figure out do we have an integration for this? Chance starts because the answer is going to be yes. But the first thing that I do here is I call list objects v2. Again, this is an SDK call API. You can go and look it up. And this takes some data, which uh, happens to be over here on the right. Um, let me see, get this scrolls over. But this is actually taking some input from, from the state, uh, state input. Um, Oh, actually, this sorry, this is the wrong one. This is the one that does have a lambda function. That's that's my fault. Uh, let me go back over here. Um, I'll keep talking through that. Uh, copy. That's a good example that. though, because actually, that's typically how a lot of people are building their step function state machines with lambda functions. So, right, right. Seeing yeah. seeing the alternative is actually very useful. So this one it uses the same idea. So I'm I'm using list objects, and then um, within here. Uh, there's a series of, I, I use a, a distributed map state within that there's an inline state. And this is what this is doing is it's copying S3 data from one bucket to another. Mm -hmm. So this is, does not use uh, a, a Lambda function, but it's just using the native API calls, VR SDK mm -hmm. integrations. And yeah. so, um, you know, what, what I do here is again, I'm just using these, these APIs, APIs and I'm using uh, step functions to orchestrate how to move through, how to, how to use them. is like how to move through this workflow to do the job of copying data from one S3 bucket to another. Um, at, at a high level, that's what it is in the time that we have remaining. Yeah. Um, and I can get into any, any you know, any, any detail if we want, if we have uh, a couple of minutes. Sure. Yeah, the, just, just to add a couple of points here. So with those SDK integrations, you can see in the console there in the configuration panel, the API parameters. So we let you know exactly what parameters we need for those SDK integrations. Um, we support two types of integration. So optimize, we would do a bit more work in the back end to um, optimize those integrations or, or SDK, it's straight from AWS SDK package. Great. Okay, so we're running out of time, but I just wanted to drop into the chat. There's also this reInvent presentation that Brian and Justin uh, gave at the, to go through this in more detail. So definitely take a look at that. It's a great, great presentation. And just also before we go, just to tell you, we've got the serverless snippets collection available on serverless land. So some of the code samples that you might want to use frequently, you can find there. Also, there's a workflows uh, collection. So if you're a heavy user of step functions, want to get, get a quick start in building workflows, go to this link and you'll better find a list of pre-built workflows you can use immediately in your work in your uh, account. And also the serverless patterns collection as well continues to grow. I think we're at 410 patterns now. This enables you to select point to point integrations, select your favorite IAC tool, download this and basically get quick started into building your application. So we're almost out of time, but I'd like to thank Denise and Brian for joining us today. It's been a very fast hour, lots of questions. If you have any more questions, contact me or anybody else in the DA team on Twitter and LinkedIn. And we'll see you here next week, same time, same place. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.